Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Book Talk at the Honest Critique. I'm delighted to be joined by Tilak Devashir, sir. Sir has uh, retired as Special Secretary, Cabinet Secretary, Government of India in October 2014. He is currently a member of the National Security Advisory Board and also consultant with the Vivekananda Foundation. He is the author of four books and his recently published book, Pashtuns, A Contested History, which I have a copy here, is the subject of our discussion today. So thank you so much, sir, for taking your time and speaking to us. It's an absolute pleasure hosting you for the interview. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me and uh, to talk about my book. Thank you. So at the pace that you're writing books, it's kind of difficult to actually keep uh, like hold up of all the books you have written. But this one is actually a great addition to the debate that's happening around the world uh, on Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan's role in this turmoil, actually. So great to read that book, sir. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's start by understanding why you wrote the book and could you please tell us something about it? Yeah, you know, this uh, This is my fourth book and uh, in which I talk about the Pashtun ethnic identity that straddles Afghanistan and Pakistan. Though no discussion of a people uh, can be divorced from the countries in which they reside, this book is not in the main about Afghanistan or Pakistan, but it is about the Pashtuns. This is their story. My earlier three books, as you'd be aware, were Pakistan Coating the Abyss, Pakistan at the Helm, and Pakistan the Balochistan Conundrum. Now, in this book, I'm seeking answers to questions like, who are the Pashtuns? Where did they come from? What are their religious and cultural beliefs? What is Pashtun Wali, the code of the Pashtuns, and what is its links with Islam? Then I go on to discuss a century of contact that the British had with the Pashtuns, the Duran line, and Gafar Khan and the politics of partition, the post-partition Pashtun politics in Pakistan. In Afghanistan, I talk about developments uh, like the Saw Revolution, the Russian uh, invasion, the Mujahideen, the civil war, the rise to power of the Pashtuns in the 1990s. And then goes on to talk about the US intervention in 2001, the defeat of the Taliban, the Taliban insurgency for 20 long years, and then the Taliban coming back into power in Kabul. And the incubation of the ISKP, Islamic State Khorasan provinces and the Al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan and the dubious role that Pakistan has played in all these events. So it tries to sort of, uh, you know, uh, seek answers to all these questions. Yes, sir. So uh, as you mentioned uh, about what the content of the book is, uh, could you tell a little bit about the history of Pashtuns actually? Who are they and where do they come from? Because we have seen uh, from our very childhood experience coming from Bengal, Rabindranath Kabuliwala, where we mentioned the first Pashtuns. But we haven't had a great chance to understand the history, if you could tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, you see, there is a, a continues to be a debate among scholars about the origins of the Pashtuns. You know, there are the theories like the Semitic origins, that they are one of the lost tribes of Israel. There is also um, some who hold about an Indo-Aryan inception. But while scholars continue to debate, the many attempts have been made to codify Pashtun genealogies. And the most famous of these is the Makzani Afghani, the history of the Afghans, by one uh, a person, um, Haravi, Niamatullah Haravi in India, after he was commissioned by Jahangir in 1613. Now, according to these genealogies, the Pashtuns trace their descent to a common ancestor, Kais bin Rashid or Kais Abdul Rashid, who had gone to Medina in 622 AD and met the Prophet and was converted to Islam by the Prophet. He then came back to God and spread the religion. Now, this is an article of faith amongst all the Pashtuns who trace the beginning of their lineage to the conversion of Islam and they don't talk about or have forgotten their history prior to uh, Kais Abdul Rashid. He had four sons, 
three natural or biological and one adopted. And through their sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons, all the various Pashtun tribes and sub-tribes have taken uh, sort of root. Now, though this is an article of faith in reality, Islam actually came to the Pashtun region through the conquests of the Rashidun dynasty and the Umayyad, uh, the Rashidun Caliphs and the Umayyad dynasty in the 7th to the 8th century. Bulk first became an important center. And gradually, because of the mountainous terrain, it took about two to three centuries for Islam to spread to other parts of uh, Pashtun lands. The Hindu Shai kingdom in Kabul and the Buddhist kingdom of Bamiyan continued to be holdouts against Islam for many centuries. So this about sums up you know, how the uh, what, what the Pashtuns consider to be their origins and how they sort of came into being. Right. So, as you mentioned, like there are subtribes also. So, could you tell us more about how many and what are the subtribes and the divisions among the Pashtuns, and also that what is the struggle of power between them? Yeah, you see the the two unique uh, features of the Pashtun tribal system. So, I'll give you a little background on the Pashtun tribal system: is that it is segmentary and it is acephalous. Segmentary means that the various tribes are divided into clans or Kales, as they are called, they are divided into extended families, and they have extended families are divided into families. So it's a segmentary thing which within the uh, tribe. It's also acephalous. Acephalous means they have no leader. Every man, every household head is a petty chief himself. So no action among the Pashtuns is possible unless everyone agrees there is a consensus, and everybody takes part in that particular decision making. So this makes them great democrats. Uh, in fact, as somebody wrote, that they are rain sown wheat. They all came up on the same day. And one will not accept somebody else's leader. And the uh, best expression of this one uh, is a famous remark that uh, they are all Maliks, they are all uh, leaders. And as a Mesud tribesman told a British administrator, that either you make us all Maliks, 18,000 of us Maliks, or you kill us all, because we are not going to accept the leadership of anybody else. So this is a basic tribal structure. Now, the in sort of uh, abiding uh, conflict between the tribes, the most famous is between the Duranis and the Gilzais. The Gilzais came into prominence in the early 17th, uh, early 18th century, in 1709, when uh, 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 Mirwais Hutuki, a Gilzai, he defeated the governor, the Persian governor in Kandhar, and then followed it up by invading Persia and destroying the Persian Empire. He, in turn, was pushed out by the Duranis. And the Doranis have ruled <clears throat> sorry, Afghanistan from 1747 right up to the Saw Revolution. All the kings of Afghanistan have been Doranis. This is a fact that is not lost upon the, uh, the, the Gilzais. Only twice have Gilzais been successful. Once when uh, Daud was overthrown by the Saw Revolution and second when Mullah Omar, who was a Hothki, a Gilzai, uh, established power in nothing. Uh, uh, in, in Kabul. So there is this abiding rivalry which carries on even till today. The other major rivalry is between the Masoods and the Wazirs in Waziristan. And there is a very famous Masood saying that if your hand is a Wazir, cut it off. You know, that's the kind of intense rivalry. And this in turn stems from what is called a, a, a Pashtun phrase called Taburwali. Taburwali is cousin rivalry. You know, like two brothers will have differences among themselves. They will unite to fight against the cousins, the, the uncles' uh, children. The uncles' children will join them to fight against the neighboring family. And the neighboring family will join them to fight against a neighboring village. So this is Tabur Wali or cousin rivalry. So, you know, it all, a lot of it stems uh, from, uh, you know, it's basically based on the tribal system. Sure, sir. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned uh, in the book, the concept of Pashtun Wali, and you were mentioning uh, in your previous answer about it as well. And it's quite often misunderstood uh, by the West actually as having something to do with the religion. Uh, but as you mentioned that it has to mostly do with the ethnic code that they have to follow. So tell us a little more a uh, bit about what is Pashtun Wali and whether it is heterogeneous among the tribes. Yeah, you see, Pashtun Wali is the unwritten code of the Pashtuns or the way of life of the Pashtuns, which determines the cultural and social behavior of the Pashtuns. At its core, it is about honor 
or what is called in Pashto, Nang. And based on the triangle of Zan, Zar, Zameen, women, gold and land. And it describes what a Gairatman Pashtun or a honorable Pashtun, how he should lead his life. And everybody knows what Pashtun Wali is, what is the code of conduct. And everybody tries to uh, sort of imbibe it and uh, follow its main precepts. Now, since honor is the most important thing, you'll find that most Pashtuns will have weapons. Weapons have become a sort of symbol of honor. That is, they are willing to protect their individual honor and the tribal honor and willing to fight for it. But one of the key components of Pashtun Wali is, is revenge or badal. You know, every man knows that if you hurt somebody else, he will take revenge. There's a famous Pashtun saying that he's not a Pashtun who does not give a blow for a pinch. And there is also no time limit for revenge. As another saying is that a Pashtun who took revenge after 100 years said, I took it too soon. So, you know, this is the kind of thing which keeps festering. And the other elements which are important, like for example, Melmastia, uh, which is hospitality and Nanavati, which is refuge. So these two concepts at times even trump revenge as seen in the offering of food and shelter even to an enemy who comes to your house. So you are sort of compelled to give him uh, food, shelter, protection, so long as he's in your care. In fact, the most famous example is of Mullah Omar, who refused to hand over Osama bin Laden. Even though Muslim scholars came to him and said that as per Sharia, you must hand him over to Saudi Arabia or to Pakistan for justice. He said, where is the question of Sharia? As per Pashtun Wali, he has sought shelter with me. I cannot give him up. I'll lose Kabul, I'll lose uh, Afghanistan, but I am not going to give up uh, Osama bin Laden for, uh, due to Pashtun Wali. So that's how important and how strong Pashtun Wali is. You see, for the West, it's very difficult to comprehend a system like this. The, the Western mind, which is logical, just cannot. In fact, if you give me an, a minute, I'll tell you what um, Winston Churchill wrote about this. It's a fascinating quote, you know, which he says. You see, he writes, Churchill noted that it was so strange and inconsistent as to be incomprehensible to a logical mind. I have been told that if a white man could grasp it fully and were to understand their mental impulses, if he knew when it was an honor to stand by him and when it was an honor to betray him, when they were bound to protect and when to kill, he might, by judging his times and opportunities, pass safely from one end of the mountains to the other. So you see, the Western mind cannot comprehend that how will the Pashtun react at a particular time? Because the Western mind can't comprehend how the system of honor actually works. How Pashtun Wali works. And this is the mistake I think uh, the British did understand it by the end. But even the Soviets or the, even the United States didn't really understand what this concept of Pashtun Wali was. And um, so this is how important it is. You know, one other quote which is very interesting is about revenge or badal. Ghani Khan, who was uh, Ghaffar Khan's son, and he wrote this very interesting line about uh, you know, revenge. He said, if dishonored, the Pathan must shoot. There is no alternative. If he does not, his brothers will look down upon him. His father will sneer at him. His sister will avoid his eyes. His wives will be insolent and his friends will cut him off. One day he goes out and never comes back. He has laughed his way into a bullet that was fired by another of his own blood and race. His wife inherits from him a moment of joy, two sons, and a lifetime of sorrow. So that is how he described Badal. And in fact, the person who recognized the adverse impact that Badal was having on Pashtun society was Ghaffar Khan. One of the motivations for him to go in for non-violence was precisely this. He said to preserve a Pashtun society, we have to stop Badal. Because Badal, you know, it carries on from generation to generation. Pushed or pushed. You know, one person kills a father. His son kills this man. This man's son kills the other family. So this carries on for generations. So he tried to put a stop to it, but ultimately was not very successful. And, you know, uh, Badal still continues. Um, so how would you tell us that, how did Islam get infused with Pashtun Wali, if we talk about that? Yeah. So, you know, this again is a very interesting uh, 
dynamics um, uh, which are here, which is the, there's a special relationship between Pashtuns and Islam because the Pashtuns trace their origins from the conversion of their common ancestor case Abdul Rashid by the Prophet himself. Hence, for the Pashtun, his tribal identity and his Islamic identity are two sides of the same coin. They square the circle by saying that being a Pashtun being the Muslim and vice versa. In fact, a modern Afghan writer has held that if God was human, he would have been a Pashtun. Thus, for most Pashtuns, there is no difference between Pashtun Wali and Islam. And they see Pashtun Wali as entirely in sync with their Islamic identity. The link is through the Prophet. And which, in effect, they feel has sanctified Pashtun Wali, even though Pashtun Wali is much older than Islam itself. You know, as Wali Khan's famous statement, that I've been a Pashtun for 4,000 years, a Muslim for 1,300, and a Pakistani for 40. So, Pashtun Wali is much older than Islam, but because they trace their, uh, their religion and the, through the conversion by the Prophet himself, they feel that Pashtun Wali and their, their Pashtun identity and the Islamic identity are two sides of the same coin. So, that's the link of Pashtun Wali and Islam. Uh, so, so as you mentioning about that Pashtun Wali uh, or the Pashtuns actually, the tribe is way more older uh, than Islam. So the British have been in contact with the Pashtuns for over a century. And we have seen after the defeat of the Anglo-Afghan war, Afghanistan was referred to as a graveyard of empires. Now, uh, we see in the modern history of the South Asia has been mostly written by the Britishers. So after the contact with the Pashtuns and vice versa, what did the British learn from them? You see, I think learned uh, many things from the Pashtuns. The Pashtuns, you see, this graveyard of empires. Why? Why is it mentioned in the graveyard of empires? This land has seen more invasions than any other in Asia, and perhaps even in the world. You know, right from the Greeks, the Persians, the Kushans, the Sakas, the Huns, the uh, Arabs, the Mongols, the Turks, the Mughals, the British, the Soviets, the Americans. They have seen one invasion after the other through the centuries. And all the invaders found who tried to subdue the Pashtuns or rule the territory that you could not defeat the Pashtuns because the Pashtuns don't have a concept of defeat in the classical sense. They only know survival. They know when to run, they know when to hide, they know when to talk, and they know when to fight, but as for Afghan time. And this has bred a very hardy and a robust people, you know, this kind of... Uh, uh, invasion. So that's the one thing the British learned from the Pashtuns that you know you can't uh, rule uh, these people. You can't. Um... So they fell back and devised different mechanisms. Now the British had two problems uh, with the Pashtuns. One was the domestic problems of raids by the tribal Pashtuns in the settled areas. And the second was the foreign problem, fear that Russia would invade through Afghanistan and try and go to the sea and attack India. The domestic problem of raids, they taught to deal with by punitive expeditions, military expeditions. And I think over the century of contact, they must have had almost close to 100 military expeditions into various uh, parts of the tribal areas and three wars uh, with Afghanistan. And the first Afghan war, as you know, the famous only one person survived, Major Bryant. And uh, he came into Jalalabad and when he was asked, uh, where is the British army? He said, I am the army. You know, the rest of them had all been massacred by the Pashtuns. So that was one um, uh, sort of lesson. The foreign lesson that they learned was all the time worried that Russia is going to invade. For that, there were two schools of thought amongst the British. One was the closed border and one was the forward school. The forward school believed that we must push the borders of the British Empire in India, right up to the Hindu Kush or even the Oxus to prevent Russia from using, coming through Afghanistan into India. And the wars were as a result of the forward school. The closed border school was no, let's keep the border up to the mountains, which is the Khyber. And there's no way Russia can march through Afghanistan and then come and attack India. So that was the fo foreign element, how they think. Now, very interesting of how the British over a century of contact, what they felt. I'll, I'll just read out a couple of uh, very interesting, uh, you know, what their statements. For example, a British historian, Alan Warren, Warren described British tactical successes uh, and strategic withdrawals when he said, and I quote, on each occasion, 
the tribes in the mountains won a strategic victory despite local tactical reverses and the bulk of the Indian Army's troops were forced to withdraw back onto the plains of the Indus Valley. Then there's Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, Arithmetic on the Frontier. And I just quote, A skirmish in a border station, a canter down some defile, 2,000 pound of education drops to a 10 rupees jizil. The crabbers boast the squadron's sprite, shot like a rabbit in a ride. And another place he writes, in the young British soldier, when you are wounded and left on, the Afghan on Afghanistan's plains and the women come to cut out what remains, just roll to your rifle and blow out your brains and go to your god like a soldier. According to Olaf Karo, who was the last governor in NWFP, the frontier was outwardly left much as the British found it and much as it had been when taken over by the Sikhs. And the most telling comment was a senior British officer who wrote, what a record of futility. It all is. Now, on the Pashtun side, there's a very famous Pashtun quote, and which is, you should always kill an Englishman. First comes one as a hunter, then two to make a map, and then an army to take the country. So better kill the first one. That's how the Pashtuns reacted to the British and uh, told you what the British thought about the Pashtuns. So it was a great uh, battle on the British. And they romanticized. You know, all the writings among the British, you'll find they're really romanticized the Pashtun, because here they found their other half, you know, the savage half of their civilized self, and a man who could look you in the eye and, you know, fight as tenaciously as what the British thought uh, they could fight. So it was a terrific contest over the hundred years. But at the end of it, uh, the impact of the British uh, was very, very limited, except for the fact that heaved off a large portion of the Pashtun Empire, the Empire of Amish Abdali, through the Durand Line. And we can talk about that later. You know, they heaved off a lot of it. So that was a permanent thing that ultimately remained. But in terms of influencing the people, and they had great admiration for the Pashtun fighter. In fact, I quote from one, uh, Sir Andrew Skeen's book, Passing It On. And the way he describes the Pashtun soldier, the, the Pashtun um, gorilla, you know, his tenacity, his perseverance, his patience, the way he moved across mountains is an absolute uh, amazing description of the Pashtun. So that's how they sort of uh, thought of each other. Okay. Uh, so as you mentioned about the Durand line, it is considered illegitimate, illegitimate by both sides of the Pashtuns. So could you please tell us how it came into existence in the first place and how what is the legality of the international border? See, the Durand line was uh, <clears throat> an agreement signed between Sir Mortimer Durand, who was the Foreign Secretary of uh, British uh, India, and Amir Abdul Rahman, in 1893. It demarcated spheres of influence between the Afghan Empire and the British Empire. And all documents, statements, writings of the British from 1893 to 1947 accept and admit that it was only spheres of influence between the two empires. But in 1947, the British imperial staff, uh, they decided or they assessed that the most important part of the subcontinent was the state of Pakistan, and therefore they needed to strengthen Pakistan. So suddenly from spheres of influence, the Durand line became an international border, just with a sleight of hand. They said it was an international border. Pakistan inherited this and said, this is our international border. In reality, Afghanistan protested. They protested Pakistan's entry in the United Nations, though they later on withdrew that uh, objection. But Pakistan did not enter into any new or fresh agreement with Afghanistan about their boundary. The last treaty between British India and Afghanistan was a 1921 agreement. But this is a very strange agreement, which said that this treaty will be enforced for three years. And after the passage of three years, either side can give one year's notice and rescind the treaty. In 1949, Afghanistan held a Loya Jirga, in which, which is the highest decision-making body in Afghanistan. They had a Loya Jirga and they rescinded the 1921 treaty, the Durand Line, even the 1879 Gandamak, Treaty of Gandamak, as a result of which, according to the Afghan side, there is no border between Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. It just doesn't exist. Now, the legality of the Durand Line, there are two issues with it. One, could British India have handed over their, their portion, the Pashtun portions to Pakistan? 
on 1947 and second, what was the longevity of the Durand line? Was it in perpetuity or was it a short duration? But the most important point is the 1921 treaty, according to which Afghans, so no Afghan government since 1949 has accepted the validity of the Durand line. Neither the Taliban in the 1990s nor the Taliban today. In fact, the Taliban today have said this is an unresolved issue. We don't accept it. They have uprooted the fence in many parts. And they said this divides brothers and we cannot accept it. So that's the problem. This is a huge flaw, the huge fault line in Pakistan because they know that their boundary with uh, Afghanistan has not been demarcated and because of the Pashtun populations on both sides. People have argued, don't know, the Pashtuns have developed differently and all that, but legally, the situation is this, that there is no demarcated or accepted border between the two countries. So that was about the, the Durand line. It's a major fault line in Pakistan, and there is something which the Taliban are aware of, and they are going to leverage that. Right. So... So when we look into the status of women in Afghanistan the pres in the present context, we see the situation is very grim. So could you please help us understand the uh, context, in this context, the position of women in the Pashtun tribe? Yeah, you see, this is a, uh, a very complex uh, subject because after all, there are over uh, 50 uh, Islamic states in the world, you know, members of the uh, the OIC. And nowhere is the treatment of women as it is in the uh, among the Pashtuns. Um, amongst the Taliban, not the Pashtuns. Amongst the Taliban. And the uh, uh, Pashtuns do have a patriarchal society in which the male honor is the most important thing and the honor of the woman is attached to the male. And this has been reinforced by Pashtun Mali. Now, uh, despite this, despite this, there has been no uh, sort of misogyny uh, which is associated with the Taliban. In fact, Taliban treatment of women is called gynophobia. You know, that even the sight of a woman is uh, supposed to be, you know, uh, injurious to the male. This doesn't exist anywhere else. So even the OIC has come and talked to the Taliban and said, what kind of Sharia are you following? This is not there in Sharia. But uh, because the Taliban feel that they are special because they were converted by the Prophet himself, they say, no, 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 our interpretation of Sharia is correct. And therefore, as per our interpretation, we will not allow this to happen. In fact, when the uh, uh, from uh, scholars from Al-Azhar had come and visited the Taliban in the 90s when they were going to destroy the Bamiyan Buddhas, and they found that the Taliban knowledge, because of the circumstances, the Taliban knowledge of Islamic jurisprudence was very weak. They didn't know Arabic, they didn't know linguistics, they had read no literature, and they were not able to make arguments based on theology. You know, so they found it a very crude uh, kind of a mixture of Islam and uh, Pashtun Wali and their own interpretation. And nowhere else in uh, Afghan history has this kind of a situation happened. In fact, the first person who liberated women, who forced women to take off their veil and opened up schools for women, was King Imanullah in the 1920s. If you recall, and then under Najib, the communist regime, the most ardent supporters of the Najib of women, because once again he liberated them, they were allowed to go to school. They traveled abroad uh, to go to school. They didn't have to wear the veil. And you see photographs of Kabul in the 1960s, and you'll find girls in mini skirts and walking around carefree with short hair and no veil, nothing like that. So this is not part of either Pashtun culture or of religion. This is Taliban's own uh, interpretation of Sharia. And which is treating women so uh, poorly. In fact, if you recall recently the uh, uh, Pakistan envoy uh, to the UN made this horrible statement that this is not based on religion, but this is on Pashtun culture. Actually, it's not part of Pashtun culture at all. It is not. You know, women are not um, treated in the manner in which Taliban is treating them. Yes, sir. And since you're mentioning uh, about uh, the sect, of Islam that they follow, and uh, it's it's amusing that generally considered that Pashtuns were practicing Muslims, but they didn't exercise Islam on a judicial basis on the society. Uh, only when the Afghan Pashtuns rulers established a central government, they started using religion. So, could you tell us a little bit about this and what were the major cultural and socio-political changes that we've observed with the Soviet and the U.S. invasion uh, in this culture and 
We've also seen a move from the Diobandi sect to the intuition of Wahhabism and Salafism. Of course, there's a hand in Pakistan there. But how does this change take place in Afghanistan? You see, uh, as I mentioned, even though the Pashtuns believe that they're the most devout Muslim because of the uh, ancestor was converted by the Prophet, yet in the, the Pashtuns followed a very folksy kind of Islam. You know, they would wear tavis, they would go on urz, they would seek... Uh, blessings from their saint or the peers. These are the kind of things which are not really um, uh, you know, sanctified uh, by the Quran or by Islam. Uh, as this famous Pashto saying is that they follow half the Quran. The traditional uh, uh, you know, sentiments, the traditions, the local culture, that has prevailed. In fact, uh, it's not very well realized that one of the uh, this Pashto area was one of the strongest centers of Sufi Islam, um, uh, right throughout history. You know, cities like Balkh, Kandahar, Ghazni, Kabul, Peshawar, were very strong centers of uh, Sufi culture. In fact, Herat is called Khake Aulia, the soil of Sufi saints. Ghazni is known as the abode of Sufi saints. The most famous Sufi shrine in uh, Pakistan, the Data Darbar in Lahore, is actually where a Pashtun al Hajveri who came from Ghazni and settled in Lahore and was called Data Saab, or the giver of uh, benefits, he's buried there. They're the most famous Sufi shrine. Uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali was a Nakshbandiya Sufi. But, so there's a strong mixture of Diobandi and Sufism in, in the, among the Pashtuns. Uh, in fact, once again, another example that Mullah Omar, teacher was Haji Baba, a Sufi teacher called Haji Baba. And Mullah Omar every week used to go to the grave of his teacher and uh, you know pray over there. And this is the main difference or a major difference he had with the Al Qaeda, according to whom, you know, praying on the grave of your uh, or anybody was uh, you know blasphemous or you know, heretical. You know, uh, they, they had a big difference with him on that. But he continued to do so. When the Soviet invasion took place and a whole lot of Arab fighters came from the Middle East, they brought with them the Wahhabi Sulfi influence. And they set up madrasas where the Taliban were educated and trained. And because of the money, this influence started spreading all over the Pashtun areas. Then the tabli activities of the Tablighi Jama. So the Diobandi Sufi tradition got modified because of 20 years of war and the influence of the Arabs who came and started, the Wahhabi Salafi influence started influencing the, uh, the Pashtun's original uh, idea. So that's why you find it's an admixture and with the Taliban, it has gone to another extreme. So, as you mentioned in the book, the division between the Pashtunized Islamist, secular Pashtun nationalist, and the statist. Could you please tell us a bit, little bit more about how these divisions are affecting the Pashtuns today? Yeah, you know, this is not a uh, not fixed divisions. They keep changing according to time. You see, 1947. Because of Bacha Khan and his idea of Pashtunistan, perhaps um, the Pashtun nationalists were in a strong position or in a, uh, you know, a, even in a majority. Pashtun Islamists came into their fore after the Soviet invasion and thereafter. You know, when a lot of madras was set up and a lot of funds were given to the, uh, the Maldives. Statists who believe that the, the Pashtun areas of Pakistan should continue to remain in Pakistan they are the beneficiaries of it in the army, uh, in the trucking business. The largest or the biggest Pashtun city in the world is Karachi. It's not Peshawar, Kabul or Kandahar. So they are the status who believe in the status quo. So these categories keep moving. You know, they keep shifting. So there is division among the Pashtuns on these three lines, but these are not fixed ideologies. They keep changing as per the circumstances. Right. Now, let's come to the inevitable question of Pakistan. When did Pakistan start taking interest in the Taliban? And how is the Pashtu Pashtunistan one of the biggest fault lines in, the, in their history? I think there's a background uh, to this. And if you give me a couple of minutes, I'll explain. It starts off pre-partition. NWFP, what is Khyber Pakhtun Khan today, was a problem, was a very... Uh, Difficult province for Congress, for the Muslim League, and for the British. It was 96% Muslim majority. It had voted the Congress Khudai Khidmatgar government into power in 19, 
46 and even earlier. For the Congress to retain this province is very important because Congress could show that it represented all India, not only the Hindus. For the same reason, the Muslim League wanted to ensure that they have a government in NWFP. So then Jinnah could rightly claim to represent all Muslims because if a 96% Muslim majority province is not with you, then how do you claim to be representing the Muslims? Now the British had the same problem with the Muslim League. They wanted to partition India, in their conception, a Hindu India and a Muslim Pakistan. But if NWFP was to go with the Congress as there was a Congress government, then their whole partition plan fell through. In fact, the results of the 46 elections were described by Lord Ismay, who was the uh, you know, a, a chief of staff of Mountbatten, as a bastard situation where a Muslim-majority province had voted a Congress government into power. So Mountbatten was determined that this verdict has to be overturned. First, he said fresh elections, but everybody shot it down, even the Congress, that 46 elections were held in 1946. How can you hold elections again in 1947? Then he came up with the idea of a referendum, that you hold a referendum because the British were worried that if the option of accession to India or Pakistan was given to the provincial assembly, like it was given to all the other assemblies in India, the Congress government could well have voted for accession to India. What happens to the whole partition plan then? So this referendum was, let the people decide to vote between accede to India or to Pakistan. The Kudai Khidmatgar, Gaffar Khan and his brother Khan Sab said nothing of the sort. If there has to be a referendum, it has to be between Pashtunistan. You know, the Pashtunistan option must be there because we've just voted last year and the people voted for accession to India. So you have to have Pashtunistan. Mountbatten said nothing. So ultimately, the partition plan had a referendum and the choice was only between India and Pakistan. Therefore, the Khudai Khidmatgar boycotted the resolution and the referendum and the rest was history. But because he had talked about Pashtunistan, the successor uh, Pakistan government always viewed the Pashtuns, especially the Khudai Khidmatgar, with a lot of suspicion. In fact, Jinnah, within one week of Pakistan's creation, dismissed the Khudai Khidmatgar government uh, for no real um, uh, reason. And since then, this suspicion has been there. And the Afghan government played on this. They raised the issue of Pashtunistan at, and they had three different conceptions of it. One, merger back into Afghanistan, into a greater Afghanistan, independence of Pashtunistan within Pakistan or a larger province or with, uh, with autonomy. So this is one part of the, 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 the uh, question that you asked. Durand and I have already talked about why that is a fault line, why Pashtunistan is a fault line. So for Pakistan, especially after Zia came into power, the whole idea was how do you get rid once and for all this issue of Afghan, uh, Pashtunistan and the revanchist schemes that any Afghan government, a strong Afghan government in the future can play about. So for Zia, the Soviet invasion was God-given because it helped him Six of the seven Mujahideen parties were Pashtun. And among the Pashtuns, he strengthened Gulbuddin Hikmatyar, who was the most radical of all the Pashtun leaders. And the deal was that Hikmatyar will come into power in Kabul. And then Afghanistan and Pakistan would have a confederation. And that way you will do away with the whole issue of Durand Line and Pashtunistan because, you know, then uh, Pakistan would have got its way. The tragedy for Pakistan was that Hikmatyar could not get Kabul. And it was the Tajik Rabani and Masood who took um, uh, took over Kabul. When they realized that Hikmatyar had failed, they came across this force which had come up on its own in Kandahar, the Taliban led by Mullah Omar, a very small force. And Pakistan started supporting it and supporting it and made it into such a huge force that they took over Kabul. Then again, you know, in the 90s, Pakistan thought, well, our issue of uh, Pashtunistan and the Durand Line has been solved because now the Kabul, uh, you know, is, is with the Taliban. Then, of course, you know what happened. The Twin Towers, the Taliban were out of power. And 20 years, you know, uh, the Taliban were in wilderness. Again, Pakistans became fearful that with a government in Kabul, which was friendly towards India and not towards Pakistan, they would be caught in a pincer movement between Afghanistan, talking about the Durand Line and India on the other side. So they maneuvered to bring the Taliban back into power in uh, Kabul. And ultimately, in 2021, they succeeded. The tragedy for Pakistan was 
that whereas they thought that the Taliban would serve their security interests at least in three respects. One, they would recognize the Durand line. Second, they will push India out of Kabul. And third, they would defang the Tehrik-e Taliban Pakistan. And we can talk about the TTP in detail uh, uh, later. But the first two objectives were not met. The Taliban have not recognized the Durand line, as I discussed earlier. India is back in Kabul on the invitation of the Taliban. And the Taliban want India to complete the uh, infrastructure projects. And Mullah Yaqub, the defense minister, and Salah Mullah Omar has even offered to send Afghan military officers to India for training. So that for Pakistan is a big anathema. And they find that their security situation has really deteriorated. So this is where Pasht Pakistan comes into this whole Pashtunistan issue. Their whole policy for the last 40 years has been geared towards uh, reducing the salience of Pashtunistan issue among the Pashtuns of Pakistan and the issue of irredentism in Afghanistan. And for that, they've exploited the religious sentiments of the Pashtuns and radicalized them. And the tradition of Pashtun society has been rent asunder and the consequences of are there all to see. So TTP, the third issue, we can talk whenever you ask me a question on the TTP. So that's where Pakistan and Pashtunistan come in. Yes, sir. As you uh, really well, uh, like you mentioned it really well about the history of Pashtunistan and where the demand started. Uh, and we've seen there was a lull moment in between. But in 1970s, we have seen the de demand for independent Pashtunistan was again at its peak. But the Pakistan military was able to crush the rebellion. Again, 2014 onwards, we've seen a new wave of the nonviolent movement for Pashtunistan by the PTM. So why is Pakistan's military right now uh, repressing a huge non-violent Pashtun uh, movement? And th is there a similarity between the 70s and the current situation at the moment? You see, the PTM is not a movement of Pashtunistan. You mentioned Pashtunistan. It is not. It's a civil rights movement. It started off when one Mesud youth was killed in an encounter in Karachi in 2018. Huh? Nakibullah Masood. He was killed by an encounter specialist called Rao Anwar, who had about 440 such killings to his name. So the PTM started off as a protest movement. There was the Mesud uh, Kaumi Jarga, then there was the Pashtun uh, Long March came to Islamabad in January 2018. And the PTM arose from that. That their well, USP is that, look, we are Pakistanis. The rights that are guaranteed to us on the Pakistan constitution the rights that the Punjabis, the Sindhis, and others people enjoy, we want the same rights. Don't use us as cannon fodder for your foreign policy goals. And we are not going to be jihadis. We are not going to uh, fight for you any longer. So it's a civil rights movement. It's a non-political movement. And because it's a non-political movement, the army doesn't know how to deal with it. You know, the army can deal with a militant movement. It can deal with a political movement by giving them loaves of office, throwing money on their face. They can't deal with it. It's like uh, the civil rights movement that started in Bangladesh. They don't know how to deal with Mujib because it was a protest movement. He, taught, he had his points, those various uh, famous points of uh, for uh, autonomy and things like that. Similarly with the PTM, you know, they have a totally non-violent, non-confrontational civil rights movement talking about Pakistan's constitution. And that's the reason why they can't deal with it. You know, as the saying goes, that if all if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So Pakistan Army loves to go and bash in uh, people like they did with the Sindhis, like they did with the Baloch, or what they're trying to do with the Pashtuns. But the PTM, they can't get a handle on it. So the PTM is not for Pashtunistan, not yet. At least not yet. They, they have never mentioned about it. But they have some very interesting slogans uh, that they have come out. You know, this, ye jo gardi hai, iske piche vardi hai. You know, they are saying that the people who are supporting the terrorists uh, is the army. Then the famous one of Laro Baryo Afghan. That is the low as in the lowlands of Pakistan and the high as the highlands of Afghanistan are one, you know, which is a very dangerous uh, thing for the army. So there, it's a peaceful rights movement. Yes, yeah, sir. So I wanted to move a little bit from Pakistan to a little bit about India. We know that uh, there has been historical connection between the Pashtuns and India and uh, the Karani dynasty was one of the last dynasties to even hold the Bengal Sultanate was of the Pashtun origin. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, the historic relationship between the Pashtuns and India and the perception currently or historically towards India? 
اسی انڈین کنیکشن دا پشتون گوز بیک ٹو مہا بھارت گندھاری واز آفٹر آل فرام پشاور یو نو شی کیم اینڈ اینڈ یو نو مہا بھارت دین یو ہیڈ چندر گپتا موریا ہو ڈیفیٹیڈ دا گریکس اینڈ ایکسٹینڈ انٹائر ٹو کابو اشوکا دیر سو مینی اشوکا انسکرپشن اینڈ پلرز دیٹ کیپ کمنگ اپ بینگ ایکسکریٹیڈ دین یو ہیڈ دی ہندو شاہی کنگڈم ان کابل اینڈ دی بدھس کنگڈم ان بامیان and there is also it's not just a one way thing there was a lot of pashtuns who came in to india first a lot came in with mehmud of gori and many of them settled down then you had three pashtun dynasties in the delhi sultanate you had the uh, khiljis yeah, alauddin khilji was the most famous of them you had the lodis and then you had sher shah suri and even after uh, the moguls came back there were a lot of uh, uh, pashtun mansabdars under um, akbar and under aurangzeb and shah jahan and even later on you know like bhopal tonk uh, farukhabad royalkhand you know all these areas had pashtun uh, who were settled over here and even till today there's a lot of in fact uh, i believe i was told this that the largest repository of pashtun documents original pashtun documents is in india you know in various private collections and in various museums so there's a very strong connect civilizational uh, connect between india and the pashtuns and uh, for the last 20 years the goodwill for india has gone up exponentially because of the uh, kind of uh, economic assistance and work that india has done in afghanistan you know we uh, some like 3 billion dollars worth of projects whether it was the parliament building whether it was dams whether it was children's hospital whether it was construction of roads and people recognize that india has no agenda in afghanistan you know we are doing it for the sake and benefit of the afghan people we want the afghan people to prosper and we want afghanistan to stand on its feet and be a sovereign independent country therefore there is a lot of goodwill and you have a whole lot of afghan students who are studying uh, uh, army officers have come for training over here there are scholars uh, uh, university of jalalabad has a hindi department you know so there is a very strong connection between the two right so 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 you mentioned in the book about the lack of internal resources to pay for the governance and the defense and we have seen that's also one of the reasons why afghanistan is being in, in, entrenched towards the illicit economy and narco trade how will you how will this lead to an increase in dependency on the foreign contributions and even more rise in the narco trade the foreign dependency uh, uh, as i mentioned whether it was ever shah abdali who whose foreign thing was to go and loot uh, raid into india uh, uh, amir abdul rahman he depended on subsidies from uh, britain uh, the karzai and ghani government depended from funds from the us the present government has a problem because their funds have been frozen but i think they have also Uh, narcotics trade they, they themselves don't indulge in uh, narcotics but narcotics trade is certainly flourishing there's more opium being grown but they've also managed to get a lot of funds from trade you know trading in central asia and trading through uh, uh, pakistan so afghanistan has this problem uh, it has a lot of mineral wealth but those mines are in places where you have to invest a lot of money to recover those uh, that mineral wealth the chinese have signed a contract but i think even the chinese will be very cagey the us is there for 20 years and people talk about 2 trillion worth of resources mineral resources but the us uh, you know for 20 years they couldn't do it or they didn't want to do it because it is inaccessible areas and to invest in building roads big heavy machinery start uh, prospecting it was not worth their while so it is a problem it is a problem i think the narco trade is going to continue till there's more developmental work that takes place and but uh, afghanistan itself is able to stand on its own feet but let me tell you today afghan economy is doing better than the pakistan economy so that has to tell you something you know about the potential that afghanistan has exactly sir and uh, in fact that's where uh, my next question lies about pakistan and afghanistan so the current situation in afghanistan especially we have seen the iskp is concentrating its war efforts on targeting uh, taliban fighters and will this again lead to a civil war like situation uh, we have seen fresh attacks again now the pakistani government again has been blaming afghanistan for hosting multiple terror camps 
on its own and not acting upon the uh, the uh, the uh, the Tehreek Taliban in Pakistan actually. So, how do you see uh, will this uh, play up? And especially, do you think will this be a security threat for India in the future? Especially a kind of unstable Pakistan. So, you see, let me take up the TTP first, and I'll come to the other training camps. You see, when the US invaded in two thousand and one. The Taliban, many Taliban fighters took shelter and sanctuary in Waziristan, North Waziristan and South Waziristan. And the uh, tribesmen who were there, the Wazirs and the Masoods, they looked after them, gave them shelter, gave them home, gave them food. These guys settled down and married. And then they came back into power. Today, the TTP requires shelter and sanctuary. And there is no way that the Afghan Taliban are going to turn them over. This is the third point that I had mentioned about the TTP. There is no way that they are going to turn them over to the, uh, defang them or turn them over to Pakistan. Because as per Pashtun Valley, they sought shelter, they were given shelter and sanctuary. Now the TTP has sought shelter and so they have to protect them and give them shelter. That at best, we will facilitate talks between you and the TTP. As they have done twice, there was a ceasefire, but the uh, Pakistan government was not in a position to accept the demands of the TTP. So they're back to fighting. And this Peshawar mosque that took place recently, attack, suicide attack last month, and the attack in Karachi. There have been attacks in Quetta. They've targeted the Chinese. So this is going to continue, and this is going to get steadily worse uh, for Pakistan. So that's as far as the TTP is concerned. Now for Pakistan to accuse Afghanistan for giving shelter, it's, it's you know, that's the reason for that. But it's very rich for Pakistan to say so, because Pakistan is also has camps of the Jaish and the lashkar e taiba which are anti-India groups, also in these areas. So what about that? So you know, Pakistan always distinguishes between good and bad terrorists. And those guys, as far as we are concerned, are bad terrorists. So, but they have, Pakistan has given shelter to them. So they can't turn around and tell the Afghans, that, look, why come you're giving shelter to the, the TTP? About the ISKP that you began with, yes, the ISKP has ideological differences with the Taliban. They think that the Taliban are not good jihadis because they don't believe in a worldwide uh, caliphate and they are confined themselves only to Afghanistan. There are ideological differences. There are differences of uh, leadership and personality. So the I, but the ISKP is not strong enough to either hold territory or to dislodge the Taliban. So they are carrying out these in, insurgent attacks like what Taliban had done when the Islamic Republic uh, was in power in, in Kabul. So they are hindering and harassing the Taliban, but are not as yet in a position strong enough to either establish a free zone or anything like that. The Taliban are pretty much in, uh, you know, in control, except for some areas, pockets, where the ISKP functions from and carries out these sporadic attacks, whether it's in Kabul or things like that. Sure, sir. I have a small follow-up regarding that, uh, regarding Pakistan at the moment that we see a kind of not like an economic turmoil. It's, we always say, the, uh, like I was uh, hearing an interview of yours this morning and you mentioned about the word crisis has been very associated with Pakistan. Whenever we think of the word crisis, we think of Pakistan. You saw, the, you saw that interview? I saw that interview today morning before this, uh, recording this interview. And uh, I was wondering because every time we want to talk about Pakistan, the word crisis comes into the picture, but this time it's actually in deep crisis. Uh, yeah. So a uh, lot of people, actually, uh, Pakistani experts have mentioned about if for India, it might be bad if Pakistan is balkanized, uh, if parts are broken, if there's a deep turmoil there, especially because of this disorder that's been happening. Uh, but where do you see Pakistan actually leading to with a deep economic turmoil, uh, a civil military unrest at this point of time? You see, uh, Pakistan has invariably been in some sort of crisis, whether it's political, whether it's economic, whether it is, you know, breakup of the country or whatever. But this time what has happened is that it's been called a polycrisis. Polycrisis is that a different kind of crisis. They all come together, they feed into each other and become far more dangerous. So there is an economic crisis, there is a political crisis, there is a military or a security crisis, there is a social crisis. And then there have been floods, there is an environmental uh, disaster. Economically, I don't think so. I've seen Pakistan this bad for the last many decades, ever since I've been looking at Pakistan. It's been bad in times. They've gone to the IMF 23 times. So it has to be bad somewhere, you know. But this time, the IMF is playing hardball. 
And the IMF has said nothing of the sort. We don't trust you because you fudge your figures. You have to do advance action. You have to raise the prices of X, Y, and Z. Tell us how much money you're going to collect. And then and then alone, we'll give you this $1 billion. The $1 billion is loose change as far as Pakistan debt is concerned. But it is important because once they get this uh, IMF program, then other countries like Saudi Arabia, China, and UAE will probably chip in with about the five or six billion dollars more, which will help Pakistan tide over the crisis for about four or five months. Then they're going to be going back to the IMF in June. There is no other remedy for them because there are huge structural problems in Pakistan's economy. And none of these, these are all sort of ventilator issues, ventilator, you know, solutions. They will continue to be on the ventilator in ICU for a considerable period of time till people start paying taxes. Did they stop being a consumption economy and start saving? You know, the saving rate is the lowest in South Asia, probably anywhere in the world. To raise the level of investment, you need a saving national savings rate about 15 to 20%. This is about 8%. So where do you mobilize internal revenue? Exports are shrinking because technologically they have not kept pace. Remittances are good, but again, they are not enough to sustain the economy by themselves. So they have to generate internal sources of revenue which is not happening. So that's the economic process. The serious security situation, because of, as I mentioned, the ATTP. There's a political crisis because ever since he was removed democratically, Imran Khan has not accepted his removal as prime minister. And he's trying to force elections because he feels he's the most popular leader and he wants to come back into power. So, and the judiciary seems to be with him as yesterday also, he was given anticipatory bail after the, uh, his, uh, you know, he, was, he lost his case. So there is a lot of political turmoil. And worse is the social turmoil. You know, the country is so polarized that Imran Khan cannot sit together with Shabazz Sharif and say, look, we have a national problem. Let's join together to see how best he can resolve it. There was a dawn reported this that a girl in seventh grade came back home and told her parents that in her class, children whose parents were supporters of the PMLN and children whose supporters were of Imran Khan sat separately and won't talk to each other. So that is the kind of polarization that has happened. You know, thanks to one man's uh, unbridled ambitions. So this is a complete uh, polycrisis. And I think Pakistan is going to remain buried in this uh, for a considerable period of time. And it's going to get progressively worse because I don't see any leadership that has come up with any uh, sort of a vision or sort of a plan of action or a roadmap that how do we pull Pakistan out of this morass? If they're living from day to day. Nobody seems to have a vision. And you talked about destabilized Pakistan or a strong Pakistan. Yeah, uh, I was mentioning I, whether, I, uh, I was mentioning whether uh, we should look at a more like version of Balkanized or like a Lebanese version of Taliban uh, of uh, Pakistan actually, especially at this juncture. You see, people say that, you know, if you have a um, organized Pakistan or uh, the other thing that you mentioned, Lebanese kind, is bad for India. Yes, certainly it's bad for India. But will a strong and stable Pakistan be good for India? With the kind of mindset that Pakistan has, and I've written about this in my first book, what is a Pakistani mindset when it comes to India? See, Pakistan is not a normal state when it comes to India. It has this grandiose ideas of parity of being superior, that they were, you know, they ruled over, a, 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 you know, the Hindus for 800 years, therefore they are superior and they must have parity. And that hatred that they have for India and for Hindus, a strong Pakistan with that kind of a mindset, you think that is better or a balkanized Pakistan is better? I feel a balkanized Pakistan, a weak, if not balkanized, a weak Pakistan is certainly better for India with the same kind of mindset. Yes, if the mindset changes tomorrow, if the education system changes and they continue or they start to live as a normal and behave like a normal state vis-a-vis -vis India, then yes, you know, you can move ahead and have a, a strong Pakistan would be good. But without a change in the mindset, I think a destabilized Pakistan is probably better for us. This does not mean that we can be complacent. We have to make sure that our own parameters, especially in terms of infusion of ideology, you know, jihadi ideology, jihadi mindset, does not seep into India. So lastly, you mentioned uh, in the book that if Pashtuns are ever to find peace and tranquility, 
that they long for and break away from the cycle of violence and war they will have they will themselves have to find the answer for their predicament and not depend on others to do so i mean of course it's easier said than done but what's the way for pastoons to find a certain sense of solution to their problem you see this is very important because for the last 50 years the pastoons have faced constant warfare and as a result the largest displacement which in recent times have been of the pashtuns whether they were refugees in iran or pakistan whether they were internally displaced people in pakistan as a result of army operations living in refugee camps living in cities working you know all kinds of things being racially profiled and alienation that is one aspect second the globalization of jihad has destroyed pashtun structures tribal structures where the maliks used to be in control and they kept the pashtun tribal system going the maliks have been killed or replaced by islamist leaders who have a totally different version and this has destroyed the pashtun tribal structure those who are fighting are pashtuns those who have been killed are also pashtuns even children have not been spared so you know these are the kind of issues which only pashtuns can resolve they have to come up with a vision they have to come up and sit across the table and do it in a democratic fashion which everybody can agree to unless and until they do that this area is not going to find peace and prosperity and if this area doesn't find peace and violence continues it will radiate into the region and there will be drugs there will be refugees and there will be ungoverned spaces where international terrorists will breed but there is also another uh, aspect to it that peace in the pashtun areas will also come into the democratic pakistan a pakistan that does not see its own security linked to the dominating kabul it allows afghanistan to be a sovereign and independent country decide its own policies and this can happen only when there's a democratic pakistan a democratic pakistan will not see security only in military terms so i think for the west and for the international community it's very important to have a democratic pakistan which will ensure so both these things the pashtuns themselves coming up with a vision and the international community helping them with the democratic pakistan that i think is the way forward right so now we come to the end so thank you so much sir for taking your time and speaking to us it was an honor hosting you we do uh, request our viewers and listeners to pick up a copy of the pashtuns it's a definite read to understand the history and the current angst among the pashtuns thank you so much uh, thank you ratan deep and thank you ekumpreet for having me thank you so much I sir enjoyed the conversation with you thank you so much wish you all the best